Hello everyone, this is Isidore, and in this latest installment of my Dwarf Fortress Guide, I'm going to teach you how to feed your dwarves. Now, in order to do so, we're going to set up a dining hall for our dwarves to uh, eat their dinners in. We're going to set up a kitchen with all the necessary appliances for our dwarves to be able to deal to produce food and beverages for the entire fort. We're going to set up a farm and I'm going to show you how fishing works, how plant gathering works and how hunting works. So first of all, let us begin by constructing a dining hall, which I'm going to be doing at this level of the fort where we previously made the um, the manager's office kind of put the manager's office in a bad spot there I would have preferred to have a two tile uh, two tile opening to the uh, dining hall but whatever it's not a huge it's not a big deal and in addition we're also going to dig out a kitchen with all the necessary space for our dwarves to store food in. And in the meantime, I'm also going to order some furniture. So I'm going to order... Let's say... Um, wooden table. And then 15 of those. And wooden chair. 15 of those. Door two. Now I'll show you why I want those two doors on top of that later, but first let my uh, I'm going to let my miners dig this out, and then when they're done with that, I'll get right back to the guide. Now for a small interlude before I get back to making that dining hall, I actually noticed that uh, one of the animals that died earlier in this guide. Uh, the stray horse that I forgot to put in a pasture uh, hasn't been moved out of my fort. And here's a little problem that you'll have when food or corpses or other junk starts rotting inside of your fort. And that is that it creates miasma, which is basically this purple cloud that really, really ruins, a dwar uh, ruins the mood of dwarves that smell it. Now, it's not necessarily directly dangerous to your dwarves, but because it gives so many unhappy thoughts, you really want to avoid miasma getting formed inside your fortress. Now, there's two ways around this. The first is to dig out a subterranean refuse pile and then put a door in front of it, since miasma will not pass through a door. By doing that, all your dwarves will move all the refuse in your fort and corpses into that refuse pile behind that door so everything can just rot away behind that door and it won't affect the rest of your fort. That's a, that is still a less than ideal situation however because then dwarves that have to haul that refuse into that refuse room are still going to get affected by the miasma and you want to avoid that happening. So my preferred solution is to create a refuse and corpse stockpile just outside my fort. Oh, then again, that is the same area as my pasture, isn't it? Okay, in that case, I'm going to go up one Z level and then make the refuse pile here. And then make sure you select the refuse pile with Q and then followed by S, and then turn on corpses. So those will get hauled out of your fort. I also noticed that I made a small mistake with designing the entrance to my fort, namely that uh, the entrance to my fort is only one, sp uh, one tile big, and it really should be three tiles big, otherwise caravans cannot come in. So just make that quick adjustment, and then you'll be right on, uh, right on track with the rest of the guide. So I'll be right back after my carpenter is done making all that extra furniture. Alright, now that we have all our furniture done and our uh, dining hall and kitchen have been excavated, 
I'm going to begin by first setting all the uh, tables and other furniture in my dining hall. So if you're looking for the combination that I'm using here, it's B followed by T. Oh, oops. I'm just setting up a neat row of tables with enough room between them that the dwarves won't be crawling over each other trying to get there. Nope. Remember, dwarves can pass through chairs, but they cannot pass through tables. Okay. That should set up our dining hall quite nicely. Now I'm also going to construct a little wall there just for the doors. Let me actually make two more doors. Okay, and now I'm going to construct my uh, kitchen. Now, preferably, I'm going to build at least three kitchens. Two fish cleaners and two stills. So in order to do that, I'm going to press B, followed by W to get in my workshops. And then I'm going to select the kitchen. I'm going to leave enough space between them for dwarves to be able to pass them, because it is going to get quite busy in here later. So three kitchens. Oh, let me actually make fisheries first. Two fisheries. And to top it off, two stills. And then after that, I'm going to press P and then F and create a food stockpile. There we go. So now our dwarves are going to rush in and construct all of these buildings that I just placed, as well as place all the furniture for our dining hall. And let's see, let's go back into our... Oh, what's this? Oh, uh, never mind. And I'm going to go back into our little uh, custom stockpile here, and I'm going to turn off food. And I should also set that off in the settings for my custom stockpile so I don't forget about it later. That will force all the dwarves to move all the food that I have gathered so far down into the kitchen. As you can see, they're very busy moving all the, all the materials around now. And now... Now, let me make one more door. You Honestly, you can never have enough doors. So now, you can already see that our fish cleaner is already using the, uh, the fishery here. Because, thankfully, uh, processing raw fish into uh, edible fish is an automatic process, so you don't actually have to bother with that all too much. Every time your dwarves catch fish, they'll automatically bring it to the fishery for processing. Now, now that we have our kitchen set up, however, we are going to want to change some of our settings. So press Z, and then go to the kitchen tab in the top left corner. Now, this is important because one of the big problems with cooking is that a lot of the um, a lot of the things that your dwarves can cook and brew will not get, uh, yield seeds if you cook them. They will yield se seeds if they're eaten raw or if they're brewed, but not otherwise. So it's important to go to the plump helmet that you have in your stock and then press C. This turns the cook permission into red, ensuring that your plump helmets will not be cooked. Because plump helmets will form the, uh, the uh, most important part of your dwarf's diet. So you do not want to cook those un uh, until you have a very uh, sizable number of them. 
So let's see what other stuff we have. Oh, we're actually quite low on food. It's probably a good thing that I'm doing this for my next, uh, for this video. Otherwise, my dwarves would have started to starve right about now. So, I am, however, going to start brewing. And in order to support that, I'm going to make some wooden pots. You can store, um, you can store uh, food items, including beverages, in both barrels and pots. But you cannot store. But the only food item that you cannot store in a pot, but you ha can store in a barrel, is the is milk. Everything else you can pretty much store in a pot, and pots require far less resources to make. So making sure you have a good supply of pots is vital to be able to keep up with your brewers and your cooks and your farmers, etc., etc. Okay, so let's see. I'm also going to start telling my cook to start preparing easy meals. You see, your cook can prepare three different types of meals. Easy, fine, and lavish. And each of these is... And easy meals are the easiest for your cook to make. He produces them the fastest and they require the least ingredients. And dwarves get happy thoughts from eating meals rather than just eating raw, unprocessed food. However, higher levels of, of meals, such as fine and lavish, will provide your dwarves with uh, a meal that pr has more ingredients in them. They're not more nutri nutritious, so if your fort is uh, starving for food, please do not make higher level, uh, please do not make the higher level food, uh, focus on easy meals. But uh, lavish meals, for instance, have a much bigger chance of giving a dwarf something that he'll like to eat because there's more ingredients in the meal. So generally, once your food supply has been properly set up, that's when you are going to want to uh, uh, get your. Uh, that's when you're going to want to start preparing lavish meals. So next. I'm going to dig out a little area in the sand here. And I'm specifically targeting the sand because I want to make sure that my dwarves can grow crops here. You see, dwarves can grow crops both above ground and underground. But we're going to focus on underground farming first because it is the safest way for your dwarves to get their crops. Also, I see that my doors are all complete. So I'm going to put a, another set of doors here and another door here for later. Now, these two doors, uh, let me look at them. These two doors here are very important because all too often your dwarves will be too busy to properly manage your food stores and something will inevitably start rotting. And when it does, it will start spreading miasma. And because your kitchen is right next to your main staircase, stairwell, you do not want that miasma spreading into the rest of your fort. You want to keep it contained in your kitchen. And that's what those two doors are for. So let's see. I'm going to let my miner dig this out. And then as soon as he's done, I'm going to get back to this. So here the caravan actually happened to arrive at my fort. But as you can see in the bottom right corner, but don't worry about the if the don't worry about it if the caravan shows up at your fort. You're unlikely to have much to trade at this point, so it's not going to be all that important to you. But later on in the game, as you start getting your industries going, trading with other dwar other other nations and other dwarves is going to become pretty important. Not vital, but it's a great extra source of resources. Okay, now that we have our, uh, now that we have this farming room dug out, we're going to start building a few farm plots. So the first thing I do is I press B followed by P. And then I press U as many times as I can and K twice to create a, far, a fairly large farm plot. Your fort is going to need a growing supply of, uh, of food. 
and by making a farm plot this large you ensure that your dwarven farmers will be able to keep up with uh, the growth of the fort as a whole. And then I'm going to make two more similarly sized farm plots next to the first one. Ah, perfect. I exactly have enough room in order to do that. Now next I'm going to go down to the Z level where my dining hall is. And I'm going to indicate which, uh, how I want to assign my dining hall. So first I press Q and I put the cursor or the square or the cross or whatever you want to call it over a, one of the tables, preferably this one because that makes it easier to find. Then I press R. And I press plus as many times as is needed to indicate the entire dining room. And then you press enter and voila, you have a dining room. Another important thing to note about our kitchen is that you should always leave one of your three kitchens not functioning. This is because, uh, just because kitchens are also the ones responsible for rendering fat, which is animal fat, basically. When one of your hunters comes back with the corpse of a dead animal, your kitchen is going to have to turn the animal fat that that corpse will drop when it's butchered and turn it into, um, and turn it into usable tallow. Now, the issue is, is you're going to, uh, that if you're using all th three of your kitchens here to produce meals, then the render fat uh, job will kind of get pushed down in priority. And because of that, uh, and because of the fact that fat tends to decay very quickly, you're going to end up losing a good portion of the fat you get from butchering animals simply because your cooks will be too busy making meals. So generally I just leave this kitchen uh, unused since your dwarves will automatically render any fat that happens to get, uh, get produced by the butcher. Okay, our dwarves have actually set up our farm plot, so now we're going to uh, tell our dwarves what to do with those farm plots. So, here's the thing about farm plots. They are able to grow different types of produce depending on the season, and you can set a different type of crop for every season. For this first farm plot, we're going to set every single season by using A, B, C, and D to plump helmets. Plump helmets are one of the best crops in the game because you can brew, because your dwarves uh, because they grow fast. They are all you always start off with plump helmets with normal settings. Uh, they can be eaten raw by our dwarves in case of emergency. They can be cooked into meals and they can be brewed into into alcohol. That makes them an ideal, uh, an ideal choice for food that your dwarves are going to be eating year-round. For the other farm plot, I'm going to spice up the dwarven diet by putting sweet pods in spring, uh, cave wheat in summer, quarry bushes in autumn, and plump helmets in winter. No, you know what? Dimple cups. Dimple cups aren't actually food, but you'll be producing enough plump helmets from that other farm plot anyway. And then for the last farm plot, I'm going to focus on um, on uh, food on uh, crops that I know are, have more have more use in industry rather than in uh, food production. So for that, I pick quarry bushes, who uh, both who can be used both for food production and for industry. And then for summer and awesome, I, pick, I select pigtails, which are useful for a cloth industry. And for winter, I select dimple cups. Now, your all your dwarves that have the farming labor enabled are now, now going to start using this uh, farm plot and planting uh, crops there. As you can already see, there's already one dwarf working on the farm. And there's your first, the first plant that he has placed. You can't actually see it on the list. 
but you can't see it as a sprite. You can't see the sprite of it. So now this farm is officially producing food, and thankfully, farms can generally be used to provide in all the needs and wishes of your dwar of your dwarves. But there's other ways to produce food, which I'll start explaining right now. Now, it's important to note that you can also set up farm plots outside of your fort in the scalding hot sun, basically. Now, this has a lot of benefits because for one, you should be able to harvest the seeds for a lot of different plant types by just setting up a gathering zone, as I'll explain later in this video. Now, the problem... now. This actually lets you farm way, way more different plant types than you can get underground. Uh, there's only like, what, eight different crops you can grow underground, if even that, maybe only six? That's an underwhelming number at best. If you, do, if you create a farm plot on the outside of your fort, you can grow dozens of different plant types. Anything from plant types that will fuel your uh, clothing industry to ones that will let you brew great alcohol from them or, gr or turn them into great meals. And the sheer variety alone ensures that you will be able to give your dwarves happy thoughts with every meal. But there's a big problem with, um, with outdoor farms. First of all, they're very exposed. Um, if you uh, dig out an outdoor, if you create an outdoor farm, all the dwarves working at that farm might become targets of goblin baby snatchers, of kobold thieves, or even just of wild animals that happen to wander into the area and get pissed off by our dwarves. <coughs> now, the second problem is the fact that dwarves that spend a lot of time in uh, a lot of time underground, which will generally be most dwarves unless you take very specific steps to expose them to sunlight, is the fact that dwarves, as they spend more time underground, eventually start becoming uh, vulnerable to sunlight. Not in the same way as vampires, but basically dwarves will start getting sick if they're out in the sun for too long. This means they'll start throwing up, they get bad thoughts. It, it basically becomes a huge mess. And I mean that in the most literal sense of the word. I've had my dwarf... At one point, I had a goblin siege where I tried to collect all the weapons from the goblins and drag them back into my, ca into my uh, fort. And none of my dwarves were really... Um, were really used to sunlight. So they were just basically creating a trail of vomit from my fort to the side of the battlefield as they were collecting goblin items and dragging them back to the fort. It was it was horrible. <laughs> but yeah, you have to keep that in mind if you want to build an outside uh, an outside farm. It's very da it's typically quite dangerous, but it can be worth it if you can deal with the drawbacks. Now there's a small problem you may run into if you started your fort in a very mountainous or rocky area. In that case you may not actually have as much sand as I have here for you to be able to um, uh, f uh, create farm plots on. Uh, after all you cannot create farm plots on sheer rock alone. And that's a huge, huge problem for your dwarves. After all, that means that you won't be able to create any underground farms, and especially if you end up having to seal your fort off from an, an enemy invasion force while you muster your own army, you may find that, you, that not having an underground farm to provide a constant stream of food for your dwarves can be deadly. After all, your dwarves cannot always just rely on the outside world for, uh, for food. There's a very high chance that sooner or later, Something is going to show up at your doorstep that you might not be able to respond to immediately. And the last thing you want is to leave your fort wide open for an invasion force. In that case, you're going to have to figure out a way to get your... Um, to get the area... To get an area within your fort muddied. And I'm going to show you how to do that. First of all, let us dig out a small chamber here. And then, in the, and then additionally... Also dig out a chamber above that chamber. Oh, oops.
So I'm going to let my miner work on this and I'll be ba uh, get back to you as soon as he's done. Okay, so our underground, well, our hypothetical underground farming plot has been uh, dug out. Now we're going to have to irrigate it. So I'm going to channel out a few holes here. There we go. So now my miners will dig out these holes. Awesome. And next I'm going to make activity zones over these holes and set them to be uh, pits slash ponds. And then press, let's see. Yes. Okay, so uh, you after you set this activity zone to be a pit slash pond, press capital capital P, capital capital P, and then press F to set it to a pond. I'm going to do that for each of my holes. we go there we go now something amazing will happen basically the dwarves will start taking buckets out of my storage and then fill those buckets up at the nearest water source, which is the river outside my fort. And we'll then start dumping water into these holes. As you can see here. Let me actually make a few more buckets. Oh. Oh, no, wait, no iron buckets. Wooden buckets, yes. As you can see, they're actually dumping water into the cavern below through the holes. Creating a thin little layer of water directly beneath them. Now this may actually take a while, so I'm going to give it a moment for them to uh, spread all that uh, water around. So I'll be right back after they're done. Okay, so we've managed to more or less irrigate most of this area. So if we go and check now... Well, what do you know? We can actually start building farm plots here. Now with enough time and effort, I could probably turn this entire room into an area where I could just farm. And the great thing is, is that once you've built that farm, you don't have to keep irrigating it. The farm will stay there permanently. Okay. Now we should actually have a certain amount of drinks ready. Yeah, you can actually see. Uh, under this tab, which you can pull up by pressing Z, you can actually see that the fort has a stock of about 50 drinks. Which is uh, decent considering the amount of dwarves we'll have. But we're definitely going to want to push that number up. Now, as you saw earlier in this video, I told my stills to go produce some, uh, to produce some alcohol. And as you can see under drinks, they've actually produced dwarven wine, which I think they produced with uh, with uh, uh, plump helmets. Now, here's the thing: cooks can actually take uh, alcohol in your fort and cook it into meals. This is both a good thing and a bad thing. It means that alcohol can be used as a f as a source of emergency food. If you happen to have a lot of alcohol and not a lot of other sources of food. But it comes with the drawback that your dwarves won't have any alcohol. And alcohol is absolutely vital in running a dwarven fort. Simply because sober dwarves are unhappy dwarves. 
they'll start uh, getting bad thoughts because they haven't gotten any drinks in a, in a while and they'll start working slower, more slowly and slowly until that dwarf carrying that bucket around uh, looks like he's basically dragging a ton, a half a ton boulder around. So making sure that your fort has a good supply of alcohol at all times is vital in keeping your fort running. So we're going to turn off cooking for the dwarven wine. When later we get other types of alcohol, we're also going to want to turn those off for cooking. And if at some point we get such an enormous stash of alcohol that we don't know what to do with it and our dwarves are literally uh, producing it faster than they can drink it, then you can turn on cooking for it again. Okay. Now... We're, I'm also going to show you how to make use of your environment for an easy source of food. And you do that by plant gathering. Now, in order to do plant gathering, all you have to do is press I to designate a zone. And then designate a zone like this that you can see has plenty of plant life in it. And hopefully some trees. Some trees actually produce food that your dwarves can gather. Then you select the zone and press G to turn it into a gather and fruit picking zone. Now this is honestly one of the easiest ways in the game to get food because this means that your dwarves, that any dwarf that has the plant gathering labor enabled will just run into that area and grab whatever seasonal vegetable, vegetables or fruits or nuts or whatever is available in your particular biome from the ground and bring it back to your fort. It's a really easy way to get food, but it's important to note that there's a lot of things you can gather in this manner that you can that your dwarves cannot eat raw, which means that they have to be cooked first. Not only that, but it's kind of random as to what you're going to get. Well, you can generally expect to get certain things depending on your biome from uh, a activity zone as large as this one you have to remember that you are your dwarves are not actively farming this area for a specific crop so you're going to get a whole mishmash of different uh, of different plants and uh, tubers and nuts and whatever that your dwarves can then brew into alcohol or uh, cook into meals this is by far one of the easiest ways for your fort to get food, but it's also not one of the most reliable ways. And in certain biomes like deserts or tundras or glaciers, it can be completely impossible to get food by doing this. So keep that in mind that it does depend on where you start. Now I started in a nice lush forest for this particular, uh, for this particular fort. So I can expect to get a pretty decent supply of food from plant gathering, thanks to this huge zone I just placed. For instance, let me look at these trees here. Uh, this is an alder. Oh, this is a walnut tree. That means that at certain times of the year, this tree will actually drop walnuts in an area around it. And if you have a gathering zone indicated around that tree, your dwarf will actually be able to pick up all those walnuts and then eat them later. So yeah, this is a really easy but not particularly reliable way of getting food. Now, another good way of getting food is through fishing. Uh, any map that has a uh, permanent or semi-permanent uh, water supply, like the huge river flowing through my fort here, is going to be fish-worthy. So, any dwarf that has the fishing labor enabled will run up to this uh, to the edge of this water and start fishing there. Now, the great thing is, is that this doesn't even require any tools. Your dwarves will literally just grab the fish out of the water with their bare hands, or maybe they provide their own poles. I have no idea. But in any case, uh, dwarves will pull fish out of the water one by one, and I think either the, dwar the fisher, dem uh, fisher dwarf themselves or any howling dwarves aboard your uh, in your state in your fort will uh, start howling the fish into your fort where they'll be processed at a fishery. Just keep in mind that um, fishing is great if you have access to water that can be fished. But if 
uh, the but if winter strikes and the temperatures drop so much that all the water on your map freezes then you won't be able to get any food through fishing and that's a really bad thing similarly there might be some maps you can start on that are so hot that non-rivers or non-lakes or whatever will actually dry up completely in the scalding summer sun in that situation uh, you also won't be able to fish though there is one way around that and that is by making a indoor uh, by making a little inlet in your fort that uh, water from a outside supply will flow into your fort like for instance by doing this Now I'm not actually going to do this because this is a kind of kind of a clumsy way of doing it. But let's say I wanted a fort. All I had to all I have to all I really have to do is just channel out a t tunnel to the river. It, I mean dig out a tunnel to the river and then do this let me just take these out and then hypothetically you'd be able to just channel out all these tiles like all these tiles here and then you'd have a uh, a water supply inside your fort that will fill up with fish over time and then your doors will be able to fish there which is relatively safe if you set it up correctly but that would, but setting that up would kind of take too much time. So I'm just gonna let my dwarves fish at the river. So and the last alternative to getting food is by enabling the hunting labor on your dwarves, which you could do by, for instance, going to this dwarf and then just enabling hunting. Now hunting, uh, you have to remember, is a bit more complex than. Uh, gathering or fishing in order for your dwarf to start hunting first he will, he will need access to a crossbow meaning that you'll have to use your boyer or your weaponsmith to produce uh, crossbows for your hunters then you'll also have to provide with bolts for your uh, hunters which you can do through uh, usually through a craft dwarfs workshop like one we have over here Let's see. Yes, a craft dwarf's workshop. So at this workshop, you could hypothetically uh, tell your dwarves to start making wooden bolts, as you can see here. Though admittedly, you probably want to use your uh, manager for that. Now, the important thing here is that the types of bolts you need for hunting are not going to be of spectacular uh, quality you don't even have to bother with metal bolts if you're just going to use them for hunting that is because um, metal bolt metal bolts are particularly uh, for military purposes because they have a decent chance at penetrating armor against unarmored opponents it doesn't matter what kind of what type of bolts you use so when hunting it's always better to use wooden bolts over metal bolts simply because you get more profit for what you're putting in you never have to worry about that rhinoceros or whatever having too thick of an armor plating for your wooden bolts to be able to penetrate through. Now when the hunting label, uh, labor has been enabled on a dwarf, he will automatically go out into the outside around your fort and try to hunt some... Um, and try to hunt wild animals that are running around at your fort. If you want to see what kind of animals are running around in your fort, just press U. And then scroll to the tabs, uh, the tab of others. Now here you can actually see that there's quite a lot of different animals on my fort. And a lot of those are actually animals that belong to the merchants that are currently visiting my fort. But there's also two wild wombats on my uh, fort. Let's actually go to, do, to them by pressing Z. And here you can actually see that wombat. Now if I had a dwarf in my fort with the hunting labor enabled and with a crossbow and with a supply of bolts, 
then eventually, then that hunter would uh, would target one of these wombats and hunt him down and kill him. Then he'd drag the wombat back to the fort, back to the back, at least as long as you have a butcher's workshop somewhere. And then he'd leave the corpse there and go back out hunting. If you have a butcher in your fort, the butcher will then take that corpse into the butcher's workshop and turn it into whatever products that particular type of animal uh, yields. So let's actually go make a butcher's workshop simply for, uh, for the sake of being able to slaughter animals, whether wild or not. So I'm going to dig out this little area here. No, yeah, let me actually make another wooden door. And then I'm going to make a butcher shop from the workshops list in this room. Now, the great thing about this is, is that this puts the butcher's workshop relatively close to the entrance of your fort, which is exactly where you want it. And as soon as that door is done, you'll be able to close off this little tile that you left open into the workshop so that any prod and animal products inside the workshop that start to rot, which is a serious problem with Butcher's Workshop, will, um, will at least be contained by the door. Now there is one small problem with hunting. And that is that animal populations in your particular biome can get exhausted. Basically, you can hunt animals into extinction. Uh, this all depends on how many animals happen to uh, of that particular type happen to exist in your biome. And how rare of an animal type that is. For instance, large predators are generally rarer than small herbivores or whatever. Now, admittedly, it does take quite a bit of time and effort to hunt certain animal types into extinction, but you still want to avoid that for the most part because you might want to capture those animals for animal husbandry later. Now, don't get me wrong, not all animals are equally well suited for animal husbandry, but certain animals that you can only really get by catching them in, your, in, the, in the wilderness around your fort are exceptionally good at being, uh, at being far, at being like, uh, at becoming either pets or war animals or just providing milk or eggs or meat or leather or whatever for your fort. So you want to keep that in mind and not hunt any animals to extinction. And if you have hunters enabled, uh, and here's the big problem with hunting. If you have hunting enabled on your dwarves, they will automatically go out and hunt uh, hunt wild animals. And you cannot turn off which types of animals they will hunt. Or when, or how many. So because of that, I typically leave hunting off for the most part until I find an animal that I really want to use as uh, my forts. Uh, that I really want to start ranching with, basically. So... Maybe cave alligators. I had a lot of success success with cave alligators at one point, or giant rhinoceroses. It kind of depends on what you specifically want. Now, explaining exactly how animal husbandry works in this game is complicated and hard to set up at the start of the game, so I'm not going to dive into this in uh, this video, but I might. Um, dive into it in a later video where I'll go into in depth at how to get it set up, which animals are really well suited for it, etc. etc. And that's my uh, tutorial in how to set up your food supply in your fort. Now, for the next time that we'll get back to this fort, we're going to start looking at building some basic defenses to protect us from. Uh, potential raiders or invasion forces. Granted, we're only a small fort, so we're not going to need that big, that much in terms of defenses. But we are going to need a few things just to make sure that our doors will remain safe. Thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in my next video.